Hello, and we're thinking about thermoregulation for IGCSE. What is thermoregulation? Well, it's a type of homeostasis, and our definition of homeostasis, one of our Mrs. H. Gren functions, is maintaining a constant internal environment despite a fluctuating external environment. Why is this important for temperature? It's important because of temperature's effect on enzymes, and this graph here shows the effect of temperature on enzymes. As temperature rises, there are more collisions between enzymes and substrate molecules, so you get more substrates colliding with the active sites of enzymes, and therefore your rate approximately doubles for each 10 degrees C rise in temperature. But above a certain temperature, the optimum temperature as it's known, enzymes begin to denature. They're being slung around the place so quickly and bumping into too much that their active site changes shape and therefore the enzyme denatures and it won't do its job anymore. And so it's very important, if you can, to keep your body temperature at the optimum temperature for your enzymes. And that is why we do thermoregulation, to maintain a constant internal body temperature despite a fluctuating external temperature. How is this done? It's done by this structure here. It's part of the brain and is called the hypothalamus. Let's have a look at it here. It is in this location here, just close to the pituitary gland, another very important thing for IGCSC, involved in all sorts of hormone secretions. And it measures the temperature of the blood, it keeps a constant watch over that using thermoreceptors. And as it monitors the temperature of the blood, it detects whether that temperature has gone too high or gone too low, and then it will cause effects to bring that temperature back to our body temperature of 37 degrees C. So what are the ways that the hypothalamus does this? Well, three we're going to think about is the way it controls your rate of sweating, the way it controls your rate of shivering, and the way it controls your rate of heat loss due to controlling the flow of blood close to the surface of your skin. This is an electron micrograph through your skin. Not your skin, obviously. It's not. We don't know whose skin this was. That is true. Let's have a look at it. This is a hair shaft here, uh, without the hair itself, of course. Uh, this is the root of that hair there. That's great. These are sebaceous glands. These produce lots of oil to keep your skin nice and oily and supple. And sometimes they, you know, they get a little bit infected. And we get spots and that sort of thing. Up here, we've got our thick layer of skin here. These are dead cells, the cornified layer of cells. And we've got all sorts of other structures going on here. This structure down here. This is a receptor for pressure. It's called a Pacinian corpuscle. But None of this really matters right now, but let's think about the skin's role in temperature regulation. This is an easier to understand drawing of the skin. The structures I want to look at really are these, the sweat gland, and these, the capillaries. Let's start with the sweat gland. When you're hot, the hypothalamus will tell your sweat glands via nervous impulses to release more sweat. Let's draw that on here. Sweat is secreted up here, and it goes onto the surface of your skin, like this. And what does that sweat do? Well, the water in it evaporates as water vapor. As it evaporates, it takes heat away from the skin, and therefore it gives a cooling effect. One thing to note, you never stop sweating. Even if you're cold, you will produce a tiny amount of sweat. So what we talk about is sweating increasing and decreasing rather than sweating starting and stopping. So that's the role of the sweat duct in this. Let's have a look at shivering. So we're cold and we're shivering and well why do we do that when we shiver? When we shiver our muscles contract more, they work harder and therefore they are doing more respiration. Okay and we Remember our equation for respiration. It is C6H12O6 plus 6O2 goes to 6CO2 plus 6H2O. Now this releases energy. And that's great, but it isn't particularly efficient. In fact, it's only at most 40% efficient. 
at giving us energy that we can actually use. The remaining 60% at least just goes to generating heat. Now when we shiver, the energy that we release is used for nothing other than generating heat. So it's a very efficient way of converting our stored glucose, which is stored energy, into heat energy and therefore raising our temperature. And it's all done by getting those muscles to contract more and therefore doing more respiration. Lastly, let's think about the role of the blood vessels in cooling your body. We have here an arteriole. An arteriole is just a small artery. And this arteriole is carrying blood up to capillaries near the skin surface. If we carry more blood up here and back down again, we will increase our heat loss by radiation at the skin surface. So when you're hot, you widen your arteriole going up towards the skin and therefore more blood flows up this way and therefore your face gets all red but you lose a lot of heat energy and that's really useful particularly if you've been running a race or something like that and your muscles have been working hard doing a lot of aerobic respiration that has released a lot of heat energy in your muscles and that heat energy has got to be taken away from your muscles otherwise enzymes will start to get denatured in your muscles so the blood passes from your muscles passes close to your skin's surface and therefore you get more heat loss taking your body temperature back down to 37 degrees C. That's great and that is called vasodilation. That's a good key word for IGCSE biology. The opposite to this is vasoconstriction. Let's say that you are cold, you've gone out in a t-shirt, the weather's changed, you're chilly, your face will go pale. Your face will go pale because we want to stop blood flowing really close to your skin. So we reduce the blood flow by constricting this arteriole carrying blood towards the capillary loops here. Therefore, less blood flows up here and therefore we reduce our heat loss. And so if we're losing less heat, then we're going to raise our body temperature again and that's good news also. That is called vasoconstriction. Dilation, constriction. Easy. Please note that these blood vessels do not move. They stay in the same place. You just widen them or make them more narrow. That's the only change that goes on here. They do not move. Other examples of thermoregulation. We can kind of foof up our hairs a little bit. They can stand on end. It doesn't really do much in humans. But I tell you, if you're a pigeon, it's very useful. You get your feathers all foofed up with lots of insulating air in there and that's really good news that's going to mean you lose less heat energy because you're better insulated these are walruses these are blushing walruses why are they blushing well walruses are super well insulated because they have to swim in freezing cold waters so sometimes when they haul themselves out of those freezing cold waters and they get onto land and although the air temperature might be minus 5 minus 10 minus 20 degrees Actually, they are super insulated to avoid losing heat energy in really cold water. And so they overheat even in very cold air and therefore they've got to vasodilate. And so with lots of vasodilation, they bring lots of blood towards the surface of their skin and therefore they go pink. And here are some penguins. Penguins are looking cute. These are emperor penguins and they are huddling together. This is a behavioral response rather than a physiological response. They huddle together to reduce their total surface area and they protect each other from the winter storms down in the Antarctic. Thank you for listening and I hope that's helpful.